Okay, so welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, this is the talk about the clean architecture. I gave a subtitle to the whole thing, which is a tale of durability, utility, and beauty. I hope this was re the reason will be clear soon. Um, I will try to deliver it in 30 minutes, so there is time for questions. Now, first of all, this is me. Um, well, not, that's not me, but um, my name is Leonardo. I'm a software engineer, blogger, many other things. If I have a blog if you want to get in touch, and also a Twitter sometimes. Well, first of all, let me focus on this question. What is architecture? We are going to talk about the clean architecture, right? So there are two components, clean and architecture. What is architecture? And we have an impressive piece of architecture here. Uh, I'm from Italy, this is Florence. Uh, but I see many, many impressive pieces of architecture around the world. So I want to try and define that, otherwise we are going to use names without a meaning. I looked around and I found this um, quote, this definition by Vitruvius. He was a Roman architect, 70 BC, so a while ago. He wrote a book called the De Architectura, which means you know about architecture. And he says every building the you build should have three features, which are firmitas, utilitas, and venustas. And in English, they are durability, utility, and beauty. Okay, this is the subtitle. What does he mean? Vitruvius said that every building, every everything you 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 create, everything you build should be durable, should last in time, should be useful, and should be beautiful. And when I saw this, I thought, OK, let me think about my code, what I create every day. How many times is it durable, useful, and beautiful? Useful, well, I hope so, right? I do it for a reason. Beautiful, sometimes. You know, linters might help. <laughs> Durable. Now, I gave this talk last time at the EuroPython, and it was a sort of an anniversary for the Unix operating system. It's been around for a while, 40 years. A uh, bit more, actually. Started, the development started 50 years ago, right? A bit more, a bit older than me. 50 years old, right? So when you write a piece of code and you look at it, does it last 50 years? Sometimes my code lasts one year, maybe, and then it's replaced by something else. So this is one thing. So this is what Vitruvius says. Then I went on, you know, modern dictionary, and I said, okay, what is architecture? Definition in English. And I found a couple of definitions. One is the art and science of designing and making buildings, right? Hence the cathedral and uh, buildings and everything. And the other one is more related to what we do, which is the internal organization of a computer's component, with particular reference to the way in which data is transmitted. So it's a, it's a mouthful, but it's important to, to you know, focus on, on both things. I came up with a sort of a mix between the two, and they say it's the art and science in which the components of a computer system are organized and integrated. The first of all, art and science. And this is the definition of engineering. It's not just science. We don't know everything in engineering. There's art. There is a spark. There is something that we put into it that is not written in equations. So art and science, I, I sort of... I want to advertise this. Look at your code, look at your job as art and science. We are artists, we are craftsmen, right? And then the organization and integration. Like this is about the components of a system, what's in the system, what is in the, uh, whatever we create, and how they are integrated, how they communicate, so the data flow, okay? This is important. <clears throat> now, this was my definition of architecture. I want to sort of get a step further. Do we need it? Do we need architecture? Because we might just build things without thinking about durability, about usability, and beauty, right? Um, I have some impressive you know, pictures here that out of many that you can find about architectural buildings, right? So beautiful buildings. And my impression is that as humans, 
we always struggle to find something beautiful. We always try to create something that is a bit more than what we need just for that specific job. Hence, all these buildings. Why did people go through such struggle to create these beautiful things? So, I don't know, we can discuss about that, but my answer is yes, we need it. We need it to, not just to get the job done, to be happy in our job, to be happy about our role in the company, in society, in history, if you want. There are other people who believe that architecture is an important thing. Um, I have a collection here of some of many books that you can find on the topic. Um, now, these are door stoppers. Okay, they are usually pretty big, so uh, if you don't have time to read the whole thing, um, you might just want to read the introduction to the two uh, highlighted in red uh, design patterns, the Gang of Four, and the enterprise integration patterns. They are, you know, the introduction is very simple. It doesn't, you, you know, get into details about technology or specific languages, and gives you an idea of how you might think about the architecture of your system. Another thing here, look at the dates. In 1992, Jacobson, a big door stopper, 94. Um, these ideas, the idea of architecture, has been around for a while. And this might be the, my second message today. Um, we are sort of forgetting something in the industry. Um, there are a lot of technologies, a lot of tools, that there is an explosion of tools. But we are forgetting that, as engineers, we are not there to use tools. We are there to find solutions. We are there to think about the problem and find a solution. And the tool is not a solution. The tool is part of a solution, okay? So, I see this, sorry for the aside, I see this a lot in the industry. Everybody uses Kubernetes. Great technology, amazing tool, but it's a tool. It's not the solution to your problem. You have a problem and there is a solution. Kubernetes might be part of the solution, might be not. Okay, so I push for this. Think as an engineer. Think about this, the architecture of your, uh, of your system. Okay, so this was about architecture. Now the clean part. Um, what is the meaning of clean? I can show you something that is not clean. I believe we agree on that. Okay, I don't want to work on this system because which cable should you pull? I don't know. Uh, it's very dangerous. Okay, if you see something like that, run away. And how many times do you see something like that in your code? Right? These are physical cables, but you know, spaghetti code, whatever you want to call it, this is something we see often. Um, conversely, this is clean. It's clearly clean. When you see that, immediately you think, oh, beautiful, right? It's very well organized. Why is it clean? And I believe there are three parts to the cleanness. Um, you know where something is. You know, for example, some cables are orange, some are yellow. They probably have different, you know, meanings. I don't know, I'm not, uh, this is not my, my, you know, my rack, but <laughs> I believe there's a meaning to the color. What it is, and why it is in the system. You can clearly identify that. And again, think about your software, think about your application, think about your system. Can you say this for every component? Maybe yes, okay, so not criticizing, but this is, the, this is my question every time. Okay, so this was about the clean. Now, the clean architecture. Clean architecture is the name that Robert Martin gave to a set of ideas that have been around for ages, forever. And so I, I recycled, I used the name clean architecture, but actually if you want to call it the hexagonal architecture, you know, it's the same, same idea over and over. What is it exactly? It's a layered system. The idea is very simple. We should split our systems in layers and think about the communication between those layers. And why do we want to split the architecture in layers? Because layers can be uh, removed, can be replaced. So, I have an example here. Now, I will guide you through a very simple example of an application, something written with a clean architecture. Uh, the 
example is bleeding too, so there is code on the left and sort of pictures on the right. I want you to focus on the pictures. Don't worry about the code. It's just, you know, uh, code snippets in Python. It's pretty simple to, to follow that, but it's not the focus on the thing. The focus is how do components, why do components exist in the system, how they communicate. One thing about the clean architecture, there is one very strict rule in the clean architecture, which is uh, called the golden rule. You talk in word with simple structures, you talk at words with interfaces. It will be clear later, okay, we'll give you a sort of a glimpse of this in the example. But I want to say the clean architecture is opinionated. So if you commit to this structure, you have to follow it till, I, till you die. Okay, because as soon as you start cutting corners, the whole thing comes crumbles into pieces, okay? So you have to sort of obey this um, rule if you want to follow it. Okay, now, the example is, let me see, am I, in? yes, okay. Um, the example is a very simple use case. We are retrieving an item list, maybe for a web application, okay? So we have some items stored somewhere and we want to show them to the, uh, to the user. The main component is the use case. This is a name in the clean architecture. Okay, as you see, there is a sort of a circle here for use cases. Why is the main component? Because the business logic is the main piece of your system. It's not the web framework, it's not the database. The business logic, okay, what makes Google Google, what makes I don't know, chat GPT, chat GPT. It's the business logic, is what the algorithm, the idea, how you process data, that is the important thing. Not if, if it's written in Python, not if it's written in JavaScript, that is a detail. By the way, I will say detail other times today. Uh, in architectures, in system design, when you say detail, you don't mean something that is not important, okay? It's important if you write something in Python, or in Java, or whatever, right? For performances, for example, if you find developers, whatever. Detail means is something that is not the center of my design at the moment. I can decide about it later. Ultimately, I decide if I want to use Postgres or MongoDB, for example, based on you know, performances, whatever, but actually this is outside the scope of my design now. Okay, the other part to the, you know, the, the other component I want to talk about is entities. Entities are, uh, you know, if you're well versed in domain driven design, you know what is, these are things. It, these are the components, the, the, the um, sort of uh, elementary items in our uh, architecture. In this case, I have um, a class in Python, item. Okay, it's a simple class. It doesn't have to be a class. It can be a structure, whatever you want. It's simple things, okay? No methods or just helper methods if you want, okay? Nothing fancy. Just a container for data. And they live there in the inner circle. So everybody, this is like an arena, okay? So everybody outside can see inside. They cannot see outside. So use cases can see entities. They cannot see what exists in gateways and external systems. I come back to this in a second. Okay, let's imagine in 2023 we want to create a web application, right? We want to expose these items to, you know, with a whatever, a web framework, JavaScript, whatever. Uh, in this case, I'm using Flask in Python, but it's not really important. I'm creating a root, as you see, a slash items, and something will happen inside there. Please note that the web framework is in the external systems. That is a detail. It's not the main focus of my architecture. It's a detail. It's something I can decide at any time. It's not my business logic, okay? It's something that is valid now, it might not be valid later. What does the web framework do? It's the only thing the web framework should do is to translate HTTP requests into calls and simple structures, okay? Someone uh, visits your website, your, uses your web application, sends HTTP requests, they send you data using HTTP, translate it into calls and simple structures. What are simple structures? They are um, structures provided by the language. Like, for example, in Python, you have dictionaries, lists, okay, entities, but nothing more fancy than that. This is the translation done by the web framework. 
Now, um, again, we might want to uh, store data somewhere. OK, fine. We have a repository. Here I have a database, but the repository can be anything, anything that stores data. Database, an API, you know, physical, you know, a bunch of files on, on, on the disk, whatever. Well, a database is a bunch of files in the disk, but you see what I mean. However, we don't want to access the repository directly. Why? Because we want to decouple our business logic from the specific database. The database is a detail. What am I using? Postgres, MongoDB, MySQL, whatever. It's a detail. I want to decouple my system. So I create an interface here, um, which lives in the gateways circle between the use case and the external system. Um, what does the interface do? The interface receives from the um, uh, use case data that has to be sort of transmitted to the database. Now, there is an important thing here, so it's the only, probably the only thing I want to say about the code. As you see here, I'm creating the repository, sort of initializing something, right? Postgres repo, this is the interface to my Postgres database. However, I'm passing the uh, interface to the use case. So this is dependency injection, right? So I'm not, um, I'm not linking my use case to the interface, I'm passing it, okay? So this makes my use case basically independent from the interface, okay? Very simple technique. Again, something that has been around for ages, nothing new here. Okay, the use case inside wants to do something, right? It receives repo, the repo, the, the interface receives parameters, so there is some business logic and that will be a call to the repository somehow. We'll, I will build on this later, but for now, this is what we have. The use case just needs to call the interface. And now for the meat of it, if you want, like the database, sorry, the repository interface and the repository have to talk, right? And here is where you get into the details. Are you using Postgres? Well, you have to talk to Postgres, right? For example, in Python, you might use SQL Alchemy, which is what I'm using here. But whatever, right? If you work with MongoDB, you have to use a library that talks to MongoDB, right? And to think about how the repository stores information, convert things. So this is where the code becomes a bit more complicated because you are at a lower level, right? You are discussing with, you are talking to an external system in the very specific language of the external system, SQL, for example. Um, let's go back. What happens after the um, interface discussed or talked with, with the external system? That it creates, it returns uh, simple structures. Again, I have to fetch data from the database, for example, in this case, which is SQL, and to translate that into something that can be understood outside. Look, look at this. The use case can understand only two things, simple structures and entities. So dictionaries, lists, tuples, this is Python, right? And then entities, so my items. Uh, the use case doesn't know anything about SQL. I cannot return SQL whatever it is, right, so SQL tuples or lines, that is out of the question. I have to translate it. And this is the task of the uh, interface, which at this point interacts with the use case in this way. The use case receives the interface and parameters from, you know, outside. There is some business logic for you. Maybe you can prepare parameters, you can filter them, whatever. Then you call the uh, interface, you're not calling the repository. You're not using the repository directly, you're calling the interface. And then you can apply some other business logic and return the result. Again, the result might be simple structures, it might be entities. And the second to last step of the whole journey is what does the use case do with this? It returns it to the uh, web framework, because the web framework is the one that sort of called the use case in the first place. And the Again, the use case can return entities to the web framework because everybody sees what's inside the architecture. Okay? Entities are pretty fine. Everybody knows about them. So I can return items. However, the web framework has another task, so two tasks, right? One is to translate uh, requests into calls, and the other is to 
translate entities and you know the response of the use case into responses. Web framework, right? We are talking about HTTP. So here I'm sort of sending a response, JSON, whatever, you know, translating it, translation between what the use case says and what the external world wants to know. Okay, wait, wait a second. Um, this is the journey of data, right? It comes as a uh, HTTP request, it gets translated, 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 translated. There is a lot of translation between the uh, sort of layers, that between the entity, um, not the entity, sorry, between the components of the clean architecture. Why do we do that? Because we want to isolate things. Now, the use case is concerned with simple structures, it's concerned with parameters, and someone like the interface that can provide data. It's not really specify what these things are. The database interface, the only thing the database interface should do is to concern, be concerned about the database, so it's specific to that database, right? And why am I a big fan of this? Well, many, uh, many advantages. One of them is testability. Shall we test the system? Okay, let's test the use case. I can isolate it, because the only thing my use case wants to have is a dictionary, Simple structures, right? The parameters for a web call, but with whatever generate that, it's just parameters. And the mock of the database interface. I want to check that entities are created and that the interface has been called. This is the test for my use case. This is the test of my business logic. The most important thing that is in your system. Your business logic works. Not your web framework, not your database business logic. Then, obviously, I want to test that the web framework works. So, and the web framework translates um, calls, right? HTTP into the specific language of, you know, like calls in Python, for example. So this is what I'm testing, in and out. And the last thing is the repository interface, where I'm testing that the repository interface understands and uses the, um, you know, specific repository the right way. Um, I mark this as an integration test because the repository is a third-party system. It's not something that I create. This is typically where you spin up Docker, you know, Docker with uh, Postgres, for example, and you have a running database in your system, or maybe something on AWS, whatever. It takes a bit more time. It takes more time because it's, it's an external system. It's something that you create outside your architecture to interact with the world. To be honest, the web framework is already a third-party system. Usually, this is an integration test as well, but usually it's faster than the database. So I just, I just didn't want to um, sort of highlight that that much. So testability, a system that is uh, layered is very easily testable because layers can be isolated. They are isolated. Okay, they just communicate with what's inside and what's outside. There are the, a couple of other things I want to mention. Um, with this architecture, I can easily call different use cases. Well, thank you very much. But the use cases can be connected with completely different systems. For example, I might say I store my items in a Postgres database, SQL, right? Because this is the right um, architecture for that specific type of data. But then I store my users in MongoDB, no SQL, because for reasons I want something completely different. Okay. And I can do it very easily because use cases are not depending on each other. There is no assumption that I'm going to use a, you know, a relational database in the system. I'm just creating something from scratch. So I can do these two different things. As you see here, it's basically from the web framework point of view, nothing changes. I mean, you're just creating a sort of a repository and calling the use case. Conversely, I can use the same use case with different front ends. Who said we want to create a web application? With, you know, a, we want to create maybe a CLI or something different. So, or a library, I can expose the same use case with different front ends. Because ultimately, the front end, sorry, what I mean is the um, external system that calls the use case is tasked to translate what comes from outside into calls. 
well, I can do this in many, many different things. It's not just web applications outside there, right? So, again, this is the flexibility of the system. The use case is the central part of my architecture. And then everything else is a detail, again, in the, you know, in the meaning I mentioned before, something that can be moved around. Uh, the previous case is very important because when I give this talk, sometimes people call, ask me, you know, like, okay, fine, you can generate everything, uh, you know, in a sort of a flexible way, you can swap your database. This means that basically I can have an application that uses Postgres, and at a certain point I can say, well, why don't we move to MongoDB? I just create my interface for everything, you know, and use MongoDB and a switch. How many times do you do it? Not many, hopefully, right? So you usually create an application that goes on for, for a, a, a long time with the same uh, sort of architecture. But here, you have easily that different parts of the system can use different repositories, for example, right? Different third-party systems. And this is a great advantage. Because when you design a system, if you design Spotify, you don't want to put everything in the same repository. Songs, or YouTube, right? Songs might be in S3, AWS S3, right? Blob storage. Because big files, okay? But then you would not want to put your users in S3. Doesn't make sense, right? You want a database for that. So this is a clear example of this architecture. Now, how do we do it? How do we embrace the clean architecture? How do we move to that architecture, right? So assuming I convinced you this is a great idea. Well, I have something to say here. Um, Remember what happened, what happened to Netscape. If you don't know it, Google that. Um, Netscape died, unfortunately, because they decided to rewrite the whole thing in one go. Okay, they decided to stop the world and say, okay, we will rewrite the whole application. Okay. Um, also, they had to decide that. That, that was the, almost the right decision because they were too late. They designed the application in a way that made it impossible to change. At a certain point, they had to give up and say, okay, let's start from scratch. Okay, it's a very simplification of what happened to Netscape, but what I want to say is, don't go back home, if I convinced you, and say, okay, stop the world, let's rewrite everything with a clean architecture. You can migrate to a new architecture step by step. You can isolate parts of the system and say, okay, why don't we re-implement this, okay? And start building something properly or in a different way, maybe, in, a part, in just part of the system. Okay. Um, did I convince you? <laughs> Is this the definitive architecture? Is this the, the only way we can design systems and the right way? There is no other way, right? So if you committed to some other ways, you are a bad developer. Well, this is my answer. This is my answer to every single engineering problem, probably not just engineering, okay? It depends. This is very important. I believe, you know, a lot of times we laugh about this, uh, you know, answer, it depends, but it's a, such an important component of the engineering mindset. It depends on what you want to do, on your requirements, on your, you know, limitations. And I want to give you an example of this. These two technologies, they are important technologies, okay? So if you don't know them, go and study these technologies. They are amazing. They are both technologies that allow you to play and to spend some time, maybe with your kids or maybe on your own, okay, not judging. Um, on the left, you have a technology that gives you building blocks, literally, okay? You can take those breaks and create whatever you want. On the right, you have something that you can play with out of the box. You just open the box and that's it, the farm, and you, you play with the farm or whatever it is, right? Which is better? Well, it depends. It depends on what you want to do. Do you have time? Well, Legos are amazing. If you have time, you can build whatever you want. But it takes time, also a bit more money. Um, Playmobil is amazing. You just buy the box and you open it and you play. You play for ages. Um, so which is better depends on what you want to do. And this is so important. Whatever, whoever says Lego, if, if you say Lego is amazing, 
fine. If you say Lego is the best, fine. If you say Lego is the solution to every problem of every playing you know, situation, you're wrong, because it's not true. Okay? And so we cannot enter in our environment, in our company, and say, this is the solution. Okay? No, no tools, no architectures, it depends. Okay? So this is the example I have. Always keep in mind Lego and Playmobil. If you put them together, it's the best experience. You have something that you know, provides you know, horses, the cart and everything, but then you can also uh, build something around it with your Legos. Now, um, end of the talk. Um, I happened to write a book about these concepts because I was into that. There is a book by Robert Martin uh, called Clean Architecture, but I sort of uh, tried to distill whatever I showed you today in uh, a sort of a you know um, good presentation, and it's in Python because the whole example that I showed you today is written in Python. Um, if you're not a Python developer, you can understand that Python is very simple and not doing anything fancy, to be honest. It's more about showing how you can actually come up with a system that is layered, that can be tested in every single component in a simple way. It's a free book, okay? So you can just go and download it. Uh, a lot of people already downloaded it, and I'm working on the third edition now, so we'll see. Um, the example I show you today is in the book in all its gory details. I just want to add one thing before wrapping up. Uh, Tobias here just gave a talk about growing up as a, getting older, actually, right? And growing up as a developer. Uh, amazing talk. Go back in time and watch it, okay? Um, I'm, I want to say this. What is it to grow up as a developer? This is architecture, flying higher. Okay, not just your piece of code written in JavaScript, written in Java, written in whatever you want. Not just that specific function or method. It's looking at the bigger picture. Okay, flying higher, 10,000 feet, 4,000 feet. And then, you know, playing down and say, okay, I'm going to implement that. But looking at the whole thing and designing things that can last. Okay, stand the test of time. Something that can be used and worked on by developers in 10 years, 20 years. Remember Unix, is still there. We are still using it in a different form, but it's the same concept. Can you build something like that? I hope so. We can. Okay, so let's do it. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Please. That's true. Um, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, I believe the reason here is that um, the web framework I'm using in this case is Flask. It's specific to Python. So the, in this case, maybe I should move the web framework in between the external system and the gateways because being a web framework is basically an external system that provides a gateway. Okay, the both both things are in the in the same in the same um, yeah, framework in the same system, so that's exactly the reason why there is no gateway for the web framework. But yeah, practically speaking, it's it's there. Does it make sense? So there is there is a translation between the um, sort of uh, something that allows the use case to use the web framework. It's embedded in the, in it. Does it make sense? But yeah, you're right. So the web framework is an external system. Uh, maybe, if you want, we, we can discuss about that. I have to think about it. We might move the web framework into the gateways and think about external system is the internet. Right? Yeah, exactly. So in, in, uh, where, where is it in this case? Yes. Yes.
relating the entity directly to hmm. its response, which is not an entity, it's not a computer, it's, an, it's supposed to be an information. So I definitely think there should be some sort of an interface representing the use case. Uh, and that is kind of the translation between the two models. Interesting. Sorry, I'm going to repeat the question uh, for, for the recording, so, or the question or the comments. So the idea is there is a missing part here, which is the if I understood correctly, the translation into the uh, API schema, can we say that? Uh, so because I'm basically translating directly items into you know, a response, but actually what I'm doing here is exposing a specific API. So I should translate that because outside there, there's internet that can do whatever they want, but actually what my web framework does is to expose a subset of uh, features. Does it make sense? Is it yeah. this is what you say? Yeah, that's, that's true. Oh, thank you. So, version two of the of the presentation, we'll we'll have that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming here. Um, I'm here in the conference. If you want to talk to me, so yeah, please come. Thanks. <laughs>